you got to be a little selfish in life to get out of life what you really want. And what I want is to be successful. That's what I've always wanted as a kid, and, and I'm on my way towards that right now. The career of Colby Covington has been nothing short of showstopping. Ridiculous cardio, world-class wrestling, and a personality that has caused a wave of controversy that follows his every move. But it wasn't always that way. Is Colby who he says he is, or is he hiding behind a manufactured persona in the hopes of staying relevant? Join us as we take a look at the life and fights of Colby Covington. If you like this new documentary style video, be sure to let us know in the comments section below, as well as liking, subscribing, and favoriting. It helps us out greatly. Colby Covington's life began in a similar way to many of his contemporaries. He was born in Clovis, California to Noel and Brad Covington. The family moved to Oregon when Colby was eight, and it was there that he got exposed to wrestling for the first time. His father, Brad, also wrestled as a younger man and even competed at the college level. Colby inherited his father's skill and quickly proved himself as a wrestler with NCAA potential. He dominated the high school scene and expected to attend Arizona State University to wrestle in, but fate wouldn't have it. Sadly, Colby's academic scores were not matching up with the scores on the mat, and he was forced to attend the Iowa State Community College. He wasn't the only one. Another wrestler with scary potential also attended Iowa State, little-known UFC fighter John Jones. In fact, the two were roommates. Covington excelled during his time at Iowa State, winning the junior 165-pound wrestling championship as a freshman with an astounding 34-0 record. Top coaches and scouts took note, and he would leave poor Johnny behind and attend the University of Iowa for their wrestling program. It all seemed to be looking up for Covington, who grinded his way out of community college. That was until he was arrested for evading the authorities and driving under the influence. Seems like some wrestling tips weren't the only things he picked up from Johnny Bones. He was suspended from the wrestling program for the season and hit rock bottom. Quote, that was a real all-time low and something I wish I could take back. End quote. The reckless nature of the act is certainly something to take into account when we look at his current behavior. Colby has become known for his wild use of the English language and fuck-off attitude, even when it lands him in potential danger or hot water. It wouldn't be the end of his wrestling career, transferring to Oregon State and placing fifth as a senior in the NCAA tournament. Sadly, it wouldn't be the end of his criminal career either attacking two men after a verbal altercation and receiving a fourth-degree assault court appearance that ended up going nowhere. After an interesting college career that saw his unquestionable talent almost go to waste, it was time for him to enter the world of mixed martial arts. After receiving his bachelor's degree in sociology in 2011, Covington was recruited by Dan Lambert, the owner of American Top Team, a gym where some of the biggest names in the world of MMA refine their craft and build their legacies. The recruitment move was a part of Lambert's plan to boost the wrestling training program there. And when you look at the state of the gym now, you can see that it paid off. So Covington packed his bags and made his way to the warm beaches of South Florida, a place that would become his home and the start of a new career. Predictably, Colby Covington didn't spend long training and teaching at the gym, instead opting to begin his own mixed martial arts career. His heavy pressure combined with his wrestling made the transition a painless one. Adding striking to his toolkit was not difficult for the athletic Colby, and the young fighter soon amassed a three-fight win streak on the local professional MMA circuit. Unlike many of the top UFC guys today, who spent a large amount of time fighting outside the UFC, honing their craft and building their resume, 
Colby would be thrown in at the deep end. With just three fights in three years, Colby would receive a contract to fight in the UFC under the spotlight of the entire MMA world. Not one to back down, Colby grabbed the opportunity with both fists and a single leg takedown. In August of 2014, Covington would make his UFC debut against Anying Wang, another inexperienced name who was coming off two doctor stoppage TKOs and was looking to add Colby's impressive wrestling credentials to his column of wins. Unluckily for Wang, Colby wouldn't let the lights phase him, a skill he became well known for later in his career, and finished Wang in the closing seconds of the round, loudly announcing his entrance to the UFC in the welterweight division. But thanks to Colby's polite, calm nature and the overall rawness of his game, nobody was really listening, a problem that would plague Covington's next few fights and ultimately create the monster before us today. Three months later, Covington would compete again against the, at the time, promising prospect Wagner Wagnall Silva. The fight would prove an interesting challenge for the green Covington. He certainly outmatched Silva in terms of wrestling and cardio, but the somewhat decent striking and toughness of Silva proved a challenge to overcome. Covington would not stop hunting for the finish and ended up finding it, submitting Wagner by rear naked choke in the third round. Silva next fought current middleweight contender Paulo Costa in quite possibly the two worst matchups ever given to a journeyman fighter. Still firmly in the prelims, Covington would have to do a lot more than that if he wanted to capture the attention of the casual UFC fan. He would go on to face Mike Pyle at UFC 187 and win by unanimous decision. His next bout would be on a McGregor card, more specifically UFC 194, McGregor vs. Aldo. Covington was likely watching the superstar from the back rooms of the venue, soaking in the charisma and star power that he would later come to imitate. He likely wasn't paying much attention to the erratic Irishman, however, having just lost his first professional MMA fight to Warley Alves by submission in the first round. The loss clearly stung for Covington, a fighter who had taken pride in his 34-0 high school undefeated streak and who rarely lost on the college scene. It marked a change. Covington wouldn't lose again until he had climbed his way to the top of the heap. His next few fights saw him continue to demolish and dominate fighters outside of the top 15. His striking improving steadfastly and paired with his pressure, presenting a fighter who seriously had a chance at catching the welterweight title. After a dominant unanimous decision win over Don Hyun Kim and on the last fight of his contact, Covington would finally receive the step up in competition that he had clearly been craving a co-main event slot against jiu-jitsu wizard Damian Maia in his opponent's home nation of Brazil. But it was far from a positive headspace for Covington, who was told before his big break that, regardless of the outcome, he wouldn't have his contract renewed. Looking at the current landscape of mixed martial arts, it's absolutely crazy to imagine the UFC letting go of that kind of ability and personality. He may not be a fan favorite, but fans certainly pay to see him get beat. But you have to take into account Covington pre-Maya, a skilled fighter, sure, but he simply couldn't put asses in the seats and his star power was non-existent. No one was paying to see a polite, well-raised white guy from Oregon with little KO power wrestle an opponent to a decision win. So he had a choice to make continue to be true to yourself and fight on the smaller MMA circuits, Bellator if you're lucky, or grow all your morals and go down the pro wrestling route and mock all your opponents in the hopes of not having your career cut short and your legacy halted. We know which one we'd pick.
the moment it all changed for Colby Covington was here. The Damian Maya fight was undoubtedly the biggest step up in competition that Covington had to face so far. Pair that with him fighting in Brazil, a country not known for its sporting hospitality, and you have a terrifying night on your hands. Not to mention your employer wants to sack you regardless of the outcome, and that they have made their plans to do so crystal clear to you. Yet, to Colby's credit, it didn't appear to phase him, not for a second. Covington walked out with a newfound swagger and bravado, walking into the belly of the beast and walking out with one of the most impressive wins of his career against a Damian Maya who was looking to avenge a decision loss to Tyrone Woodley. But it wasn't the win that got fans' attention. It was the post-fight interview. Covington snatched the mic from Daniel Cormier and responded to the fire of Brazilian booze with petrol, firewood, and a giant fanning board. Brazil, you're a dog! All you filthy animals suck! I got one thing to say! Tyrone Woodley, I'm coming for you! The fallout of his interview was so bad that people were trying to get into his hotel to kill him and he was in serious danger of meeting harm. The outpouring had other implications too. The Brazilian training partners back home in South Florida weren't exactly fond of Colby's kind words and refused to train with them any longer. It seemed as though Colby had made the biggest mistake of his career and in an attempt to avoid the firing squad of the UFC executives, tripped over and broke his own neck. But the UFC never called and his job was safe. So he set his dickhead meter to 100% and set his sights on the UFC champion, Tyrone Woodley. The welterweight champion opposed all of the things that the new Colby stood for, Donald Trump, Republican conservatism, and MAGA hats. He promised the world of MMA that when he finished Woodley, he would travel to Washington, D.C. and give his belt to the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Colby spent the following months building his brand. He began branding his haters as virgins and nerds, as well as continuing his MAGA campaign. The one honestly hilarious thing that Colby did in order to build his feud with Tyrone Woodley was compete in a professional wrestling match against an overweight black guy with a UFC belt. Advertised as Tyquil Woodley, on account of how boring Woodley's style was perceived to be at the time. The fight lasted about 20 seconds and featured a belly flop as well as a head kick that sent Tyquil down to the canvas. Here's the full clip.
don't know where Tyquil is now, but we hope he has received everything he wants in life. He deserves it. It is interesting to wonder what the real Colby was thinking during this time period. With the lights and cameras suddenly thrust upon him, to be so known for a part of you that isn't really you must have been weighing on him heavily. He quickly began to alienate close friends and training partners and was soon relegated to a back corner of a gym, alone and isolated from all those he mocked. Almost seven months later, Colby would step back into the octagon again this time for the UFC interim welterweight title against Rafael dos Anjos, a former UFC champion and another Brazilian. It was a tough task for Covington and his first five round main event. Having only fought in three round fights previously, it was time for Covington to show his real grit. Cardio. Covington constantly put the pressure on the always game RDA and used his wrestling and by now exciting striking to bewilder and tire the older man, walking away with the unanimous decision victory and an interim belt wrapped around his waist, an achievement that was only seven months removed from talks of him being fired. Impressive. Sadly, the time spent with the belt would be short-lived, besides a couple Twitter videos with obviously paid bikini models. Colby would be forced to undergo a nasal surgery that took him out of the welterweight picture for the next few months. Having built up all this positive momentum, it was heartbreaking for Colby to be back where he started, ignored and looked past. During his absence, welterweight champion Tyrone Woodley would defend his title against Darren Till in an impressive title performance that saw him wind back the clock. Colby, meanwhile, was busy spoiling the last Jedi and posing with trashy models and cheap hot tubs. But all the while, he was training, fully focused on becoming the champion. Despite the surgery and belt stripping setbacks, he made his comeback over a year after his previous outing against another former world champion, Robbie Lawler. Lawler possessed some scary power and even scarier toughness that allowed him to drag his opponents into deep water and immerse themselves in hell. Many fans wondered if the extended layoff as well as the veteran he was facing would be too much for a returning Colby. Colby certainly answered all questions with his best performance to date, attacking Lawler's body and throwing spinning kicks in between successful takedown attempts. The performance was so dominant that he set a record for the most strikes thrown in a UFC fight at 541 that has only recently been broken. Colby sported his stripped interim welterweight title belt after the event and shouted out Donald Trump's children, Eric and Junior, who were sitting in the front row. More importantly, or perhaps just distastefully, Covington mentioned the recent train accident involving Matt Hughes, who was at the time in critical condition with a low chance of recovery. Here's what he had to say. You stay off the tracks when the train's coming through, Junior. Don't matter if it's a Trump train or the Colby train. Get out the way! Regardless of the controversy, on four weeks' notice, Covington put a bad beating on a UFC great and was in line for a title shot against the newly crowned welterweight king, Kamaru Usman. The build-up to this fight with Kamaru Usman would be the most brutal of all, with the fight scheduled four months after his win over Lawler. It is impressive how he managed to utter such disgusting sentiments so many times. Most despicably of all was his mentioning of Usman's longtime coach's death. Glenn Robinson had been training with Usman for his entire career before he sadly suffered a heart attack in 2018. This is what Colby had to say on the sensitive subject. He, Kamaru, gave Glenn Close a heart attack from all those years he was ducking me. He also went as far as to say that Close would be watching from hell on December 14th, the date of their welterweight title clash. It was clear that Covington was beginning to get under Kamaro's skin, with the champion attempting to approach him backstage at one of UFC's annual press conferences. The bad blood would soon have a chance to spill over, however, and the two would largely save all of their aggression for inside the cage. With large fights like these, where the rivalry is so intense, the fight often fails to live up to fan expectations. But by the end of the first round of UFC 254's main event, it was obvious that this wasn't going to be one of those nights. The two gave everything they had in the cage that night. Largely a kickboxing bout, the two traded heavy jabs, 
body kicks, and hooks in combination that would have folded lesser men. Their equally incredible cardio made the bout one of accuracy and toughness, two things these men had in spades. And so as the rounds went on, the two continued to rack up damage and push themselves to their absolute limits. A right hand fractured Colby's jaw on the third, but he fought on, throwing everything he had to get that belt wrapped around his waist. It's easy to forget that beneath the visage of a sneering idiot that Colby wears so well is a young man who earnestly wants to be considered the best in the world. The next two rounds were fairly even with the judges having it tied going into the fifth. Covington was knocked down twice in the fifth round by two precise right hands and referee Mark Goddard stepped in to stop the fight, a decision that Covington argues about to this day. Like many of the great fighters that came before, he simply couldn't admit when he had had enough. Usman would successfully defend his title and be considered by many already to be the best welterweight since George St. Pierre. The fight won fight of the night and is considered by fans, both hardcore and casual, as one of the greatest fights in UFC history. Besides the ego bruising and a world title, Covington didn't miss out on much either, being praised for his display of heart and skill against a game opponent. The loss also didn't stop Covington's trash talk as he was quickly back to his verbally malicious ways, even going so far as to spoil the newest Star Wars movie. Colby would be dealt another loss in May of 2020 when he was forced to move gyms after tensions became too unbearable for both coaches and owners. With old friend Jorge Masvidal, now his firm enemy, was largely behind this decision, trashing his former training partner everywhere he could. The two will likely compete in some stage, but there has been no word on Jorge wanting to fight, with most fans considering it a stylistic nightmare for Jorge, but coming off an even more devastating loss to Usman, the potential fight is looking more likely than ever. Covington's most recent fight was one most fans never thought would take place. In September of 2020, Covington would finally get a shot at former welterweight champion Tyrone Woodley, who was by this time far past his prime. Covington was a poor matchup for the low output Woodley who circled the fence looking for a bomb only to be outstruck by volume and taken down multiple times. There was an apathetic nature to Woodley's performance that must have been a letdown for Covington. Here was a man that Colby had been salivating at the chance of fighting from 2017 to 2019, embarking on press tours, wrestling matches, and expensive bikini model time in hopes of setting up a fight. Unfortunately, Woodley suffered a rib injury in the fourth round after being taken down and the fight was ruled a TKO for Covington. Since then, Covington hasn't entered the octagon or even had a fight booked. The welterweight prince has been rather quiet in recent months, only leaving training to slate Kamaru Usman, who is quickly racking up title defenses. But with the division mostly cleared out by Usman and the bad blood between the two still pumping, we may see Colby Covington enter into the octagon in the coming months for a rematch and a chance at redemption. Whether or not he will be able to keep up with the super active and constantly improving Usman remains to be seen. Will he keep up the Make America Great Again act in post-Trump America? Or will he instead opt to go a completely different direction, though equally as abrasive? Whatever he thinks up next, it's unlikely that he returns to his roots as that humble kid from Nebraska. Despite him opening up on the charade in recent interviews and meetings with fans, he has likely dug himself too deep with the mainstream and doesn't want to risk a potential relegation to Bellator like he did just five years ago. Regardless if you love or hate him, you cannot deny his talent and star potential. We look forward to the next five years of Colby Covington. May they be equally as controversial as the last. What did you think of our new documentary style videos? And be sure to tell us what you think of Covington. Is it all an act? Or is he really a terrible person? Let us know in the comment section below. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. This has been a Dave's Top 5 presentation. We'll see you on the next one. And as always, stay awesome.